So let's talk about the difference between the APT and equilibrium models, such as the capital asset pricing model. They come from a very different philosophy. The, the uh, capital asset pricing model and equilibrium models are, in a sense, they try to be very, very powerful. They're what I call absolute pricing models. If you have the consumption-based model, you should, in principle, be able to price absolutely any asset whatsoever. Stocks, bonds, real estate, the price of water, you name it. Uh, marginal utility consumption growth, price it. It's uh, based on deep fundamentals. The arbitrage pricing theory does something much less ambitious. It's relative pricing. In the arbitrage pricing theory, we try to find the expected returns of our uh, portfolio um, in terms of the given expected returns of other portfolios. So Fama and French, uh, they, they, in some sense, they're using this logic. They say, well, we find the expected returns of the 25 portfolios given the expected return of the market and the HML portfolio. Yeah, but why are the market and the HML portfolio, why do they generate their premiums? I, that model doesn't tell you anything about that. And in that sense, they're using, they're using that model as a relative pricing model, uh, the way the APT says to. Uh, another way, way to think about the two things, and, and there's the, the right kind of model is surely halfway in between. You, you want to start, uh, um, start a restaurant that sells hamburgers. What should you sell your hamburgers for? Well, there's two approaches to this question. One approach is the Martha Stewart approach. OK, what does it cost to raise a cow? And we'll build it up from deep fundamentals. The other approach is, well, I want to sell a hamburger over here, Burger King's over there. What are they selling them for? And how much more or less can I charge? That's relative pricing. They're both useful for, for different kinds of questions. One way of thinking about uh, the difference between the model, does the R squared matter? So in our, uh, in our underlying time series regression, this regression here of returns on factors, that regression has an R squared with it. Is the R squared of that regression important to the theoretical uh, derivation of the model? The answer is, for the capital asset pricing model and equilibrium models, absolutely not. The fit of the time series regression here is completely unimportant. What matters, this regression is only important for measuring the betas. The R squared is a little bit important for statistical reasons. The betas are better measured in samples with R squared, but it doesn't matter at all to the theory. In fact, it, it is the greatest pride of the capital asset pricing model to deal with R squared equals zero securities. Here, here's an example. Suppose you had a security X here that was paying the, uh, the same return as the risk-free rate, but had a huge standard deviation. That's a security that has an R squared of 0. That's sort of like my long-term bonds. The capital asset pricing model would treat it as a great success to say, well, the expected return of that security is 0 because the beta is 0. So the R squared being 0 is, is not only irrelevant to the derivation of the cap M, but it would be a point of pride for the cap M in being able to explain why a security like that can sit there and, and uh, people hold it for a low expected return despite its awful standard deviation. For the APT, of course, R squared is essential. The point of the APT is you only expect small alphas where there are small epsilons, where the factors do a good job of explaining the variance of security returns. Another way of putting the same thing, and, and here I'm, I'm part of my linguistic, uh, my, my linguistic uh, approach, I want you to learn the languages, uh, does factor structure matter for factor pricing? Those are two very different words. Let's distinguish what they mean. Let's look at our time series regression of returns on a factor. Uh, time series regression of returns on a factor implies a factor structure. When I think about the covariance of one return with another return, a component of that covariance is how much do their, in, their betas load up on the common factor. When I derive the covariance matrix of returns, well, the first component of that covariance matrix is uh, the vector of betas, beta beta prime, times the uh, standard times the variance of the factor. That's factor structure in the covariance matrix. Does that factor structure matter? To the APT, yes. The key assumption of the APT is that the common factors explain a lot of the variance of the returns you're looking at. To the cap M, it doesn't matter at all. Uh, it's kind of a convenience, but we, we, with an absolute pricing model, factor structure among the returns doesn't really matter much at all for the pricing. Um, 
What's the relationship? The cap M, like the Fama French model, is often used as an arbitrage pricing theory. And that's in some sense why, for many uses, people don't get all upset about the assumptions. That's exactly really what I was doing in my previous example of using the capital asset pricing model in order to evaluate some anomaly. Well, I was, I was using it as relative pricing. I was saying, well, the capital asset pricing model says expected return to Q equal betas times the market. I found that for this case. So given that the market is reasonably priced, this thing seems reasonably priced. I'm using the capital asset pricing model in a relative pricing mode. And that's, in fact, the way most practical finance is done. Most practical finance wants to know, let's price something in terms of other things we know. And please don't bother me with another sermon about whether the market's rational or not. I just want to understand this strategy. Uh, another uh, aspect of the APT, uh, we do everything in, in moment space and state space. I thought I would take a moment to describe what the APT means in state space and how, how we think of the question in that geometry. So here's a picture of the APT's question. We have a payoff space. It is the payoff space generated by the factors. And we know the prices on this payoff space. The, the rules of the game are we're not arguing about whether the factors are correctly priced. We want to know, is the new payoff x priced correctly given the prices of the factors? That's the APT philosophy. Well, how does the a what does the APT say about this? Pure arbitrage says, I'm sorry, I can't say tell you anything. This thing isn't in the space of included payoffs. Price of that could be anything relative to the prices of those guys. Well, the APT says, look, let's make a projection. Let's run x on the factors. That is in state space what this regression does in, in, in moment space. We're projecting x on the factors. We're finding the smallest possible residual. We're finding the hedge payoff that is closest to the original payoff. And epsilon, there's our, our residual there. So the APT philosophy says, look, guys, x is pretty close here. Epsilon's pretty small. What price can we assign to this? How can we extend the prices we know to the prices of something we don't know? If epsilon's small, why don't we just use the price of x hat as the price of x? And that's going to be a pretty good approximation. Let's just assume the price of epsilon. If epsilon is small, the price of epsilon must be small. So that's the philosophy of the APT. It's a way of extending the prices on something we know to the prices on something we don't know. Now, of course, the price of epsilon, we can't prove that the price of epsilon is small. What does it take for the price of epsilon to be big? Well, x star isn't the only discount factor. This is the same as using x star as the discount factor to price the x that's off the payoff space. But of course, any m here can be, that's a valid extension of the uh, discount factor we have. Uh, this, if we use x star to pay off, that generates a zero price for x. What would it take to generate a big price for epsilon? Well, we need to use an m that's away. And the price of epsilon is the inner product of m with epsilon. So to get a big inner product here, we really got to move m a long way. And as we move m a long way in order to generate a big inner product, the size of m gets big. And recall, the maximum Sharpe ratio is related to the size of m, the second moment of m. So again, you can see in, sta in state space, assigning big prices to small deviations requires that you assume large Sharpe ratios can exist. I emphasize Sharpe ratios historically. It's called the arbitrage pricing theory. Where's the arbitrage? Well, there was a long effort to try to prove that those prices would be zero by pure arbitrage without having to make Sharpe ratio assumptions. I don't want to cover it. I don't think it's been a great success. It is a, a branch that's only used in theory, really, and not, not particularly guides empirical work or, or practical application. Last comment, of course, the APT being a, a relative pricing model, you can, you can only, it's, the APT is sort of like the famous story of the drunk who looks for his car keys near the lamp, even though he dropped them over there because that's where it's light. The APT can only hope to generate prices for things near the original set of payoffs. It only hopes for things that are, that are large portfolios and therefore well spanned by existing sets of large portfolios, things that lead small epsilon. If you don't have those, then you really need to start thinking about, if you have large epsilons, then you really need to st start thinking about absolute pricing, what the risk premiums of those large epsilons could be.